I'd like to lecture on engineering ethics. This is a, a topic which I think is very important for engineers, and is a topic that I think is not always taught particularly well. And I, I like to focus on what I, I consider really the, the essential points and point out where I think that other uh, teachings might have failed. Ethics is a branch of philosophy that is focused on how one should make decisions in their life in order to live a good life. And it starts out by addressing what does it mean to live a good life? What does it mean to have lived a life that is worthwhile? And then it expands to talk about what behaviors are part of living a, a life that's, that's worthwhile. On a very broad scale, you know, ethics is about telling you how you make decisions. For example, is it ever right to kill? And if so, when? What makes a war just? Uh, you know, is it ever right to, you know, harm an individual if there's going to be a greater good? And I think that oftentimes when we teach engineers, we like to focus on these broader topics because they're actually very interesting. We like to tell engineers, you know, say you're working for a company that's making self-driving vehicles. You know, how do you know when it's right to you know, swerve into the uh, the sidewalk? How do you balance the, the safety of pedestrians and the safety of the driver? And I, I think that those are important questions and those are questions that each individual has to address, but that's not necessarily what professional ethics is about. Professional ethics is a subfield of ethics in which we talk about how within a certain profession you should behave. So as an engineer, we say, you know, how do you make decisions as a professional that makes you a good engineer? What constitutes right conduct? as an engineer. Something that's different about professional ethics versus individual ethics is, is that it is a set of values that are decided upon by the professional community. And these are shared values that all engineers have. So Plato uh, wrote, and he attributed this to Socrates, that, you know, is the pious loved by the gods because it is pious, or is it pious because it is loved by the gods? So is, is an act good because God said it's good, or is an act good, therefore God says it's good? And he concludes that certain actions, certain things are intrinsically good, and therefore God loves those. And I, I think when we teach engineers about ethics, we oftentimes say, well, we have these ethical standards and you have to live up, live up to those because they're important for the community, they're important for you know, public safety. But I, I think that it's actually a bit, a bit backwards. And these ethics that engineers have are not externally imposed say you must do this because there's going to be some good outcome. But instead, these are intrinsically shared values of engineers, and they're intrinsically good and make good engineers. And I think that's also something that in the teaching of engineering ethics, people get wrong. The, that these shared values already exist. And what we're essentially doing here is, is we are listing these and clarifying them. So we wind up with these code of ethics that have been written by our professional societies. And these code of ethics are, as like I said, not externally imposed, but they're just a, a statement of what we as engineers believe. The most common one, I would say, is the Code of Ethics written by the National Society of Professional Engineers. And 
That's what I'm going to be talking about today. But most engineering societies, whether it's material science or mechanical or civil, uh, those societies have either uh, endorsed the NSPE code or they've endorsed it and modified it in some sense. Uh, in the case of material science, which, which I am a part of, the Minerals, Metals, and Materials Society, TMS, they've endorsed the ethics statement of NSPE, and those are then the same ethics that materials engineers are expected to uh, conduct themselves by. So I've, I've put a website on the bottom of this page where you can uh, look up these code of ethics, and I'm going to be talking about those in this lecture. So the implications of this code of ethics for engineering students is, is that students are expected to learn and internalize these ethics as they study to become an engineer. So engineering students are expected to not only uphold their university's uh, code of conduct and honor code, but also the code uh, put forward by the NSPE. And of course, you know, it's a learning process, so mistakes will be made. And as, as faculty, we step in and you know, try to, to write things. But the important thing is that when a student graduates as an engineer, they're being certified not only to be technically capable, but also that they understand the values and obligations of, of being an engineer. So I'm going to go through the NSPE Code of Ethics, beginning with the preemblem. So the preemblem reads, Engineering is an important and learned profession. As members of this profession, engineers are expected to exhibit the highest standards of honesty and integrity. Engineering has a direct and vital impact on the quality of life for all people. Accordingly, the services provided by engineers require honesty, impartiality, fairness, and equity, and must be dedicated to the protection of the public health, safety, and welfare. Engineers must perform under a standard of professional behavior that requires adherence to the highest principles of ethical conduct. So this is a, a statement. It's, you think of it as the uh, you know, preemblem to the creed of engineers. And it talks about engineering as its importance and its role in society and why, as engineers, we hold these uh, values. So after the preemblem, then there are a, a set of fundamental canons. So these fundamental canons are that engineers, in the fulfillment of their professional duties, shall 1. Hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public. 2. Perform service only in areas of their competence. 3. Issue public statements only in an objective and truthful manner. 4. Act for each employer or client as faithful agents or trustees. 5. Avoid deceptive acts. And 6 conduct themselves honorably, responsibly, ethically, and lawfully so as to enhance the honor, reputation, and usefulness of the profession. So these canons tell us about the values that we have and about our really our primary targets. So we have a duty to ourselves. Of course, that's all people have a duty to themselves. But we also have a duty to the public. Uh, we have a duty to our employers or clients, and we have a duty to the greater engineering community to generate honor, uh, reputation, and respect for all of engineers. So following the uh, canons, we have a, a set of rule of practices, and I'll, I'll read through these and, and talk about these. So. First rule of practice, engineers shall hold paramount the safe health and welfare of the public. A. If engineers' judgment is overruled under circumstances that endanger life or property, they shall notify their employer or client and such other authority as may be appropriate. So this is saying that as an engineer, you, know, you work for an employer, but if someone overrides your judgment and you think that this endangers the health and welfare of the public, you have a responsibility to, you know, move up the uh, administrative chain in your company or even go to an outside 
a source, an outside authority, to report where there may be danger for the public. B. Engineers shall approve only those engineering documents that are in conformity with app applicable standards. So engineers, we have a, a set of standards for our, <clears throat> for our uh, decisions. These standards have been written out by our professional societies that tell us, for example, how is it appropriate to test a certain situation? How is it appropriate to, uh, you know, for example, say you're measuring the uh, you know, strength of concrete. You know, there is a standard for how you measure the strength of concrete. Uh, and we are required to understand what these standards are and to apply those. So that's part of how we make decisions about what is uh, safe for the public. You know, if you have, say, an employer and you're measuring the strength of concrete and your employer says, well, I know what the standards are, but I want you to do something else. Well, you've just come to a point where your ethics are, are being questioned because you're being asked to apply standards or apply a measurement which is not up to those standards. So in this document, when we talk about standards, we're not talking about just arbitrary standards. We're talking about standards that have been approved by our professional societies. Uh, C. Engineers shall not reveal facts, data, or information without the prior consent of the client or employer except as authorized or required by law or this code. So even though you are required to whistleblow if your employer or client is endangering the public, uh, if they're not, then you're required to not reveal any information about uh, the product or the job you're doing. D. Engineers shall not permit the use of their name or associate in business ventures with any person or firm that they believe is engaged in fraudulent or dishonest enterprises. So again, this is about protecting both yourself and the name of engineers because you're not allowed to endorse uh, enterprises that you believe are endangering uh, the public or are defrauding the public. Uh, e. Engineers shall not aid or abet the unlawful practice of engineering by a person or a firm. So unlawful practice, that's in part about uh, laws and it's also a, in part about engineering standards. If, for example, uh, professional engineers are licensed. Uh, so companies and individuals, they have to be licensed by the National Society of Professional Engineers. And going outside of that uh, is un unlawful. Uh, F. Engineers having knowledge or any alleged violation of this code shall report thereon to the appropriate professional bodies and, when relevant, also to public authorities and cooperate with the proper authorities in furnishing such information or assistance as may be required. So this is telling you how to act when you believe that the safe, safe, healthy, and welfare of the public or any other form of this code have been violated. Uh, it's important that we have this because it gives us a process by which to investigate uh, possible code violations, ethics violations, and it avoids a situation where, for example, we have you know mob rule or we have people being you know guilty by accusation. You can have an accusation, but then we have a, a set of uh, processes by which that these are are uh, investigated, and the the National Society of Professional Engineers is one of that, but also just the different professional bodies, uh, for example, TMS for materials engineers. Point two, engineers should at all times strive to serve the public interests. So point A, engineers are encouraged to participate in civic affairs, career guidance for youths, and work for the advancement, safety, health, and well-being of their community. So you're encouraged to you know, engage the public as engineers. Uh, B, engineers shall not complete, sign, or seal plans and or specifications that are not in conformity with applicable engineering standards. If the client or employer insists on such unprofessional conduct, they shall notify the proper authorities and withdraw from further service on this project. And we, we discussed that. We have standards and 
if someone wants you to move outside of those professional standards, then you need to uh, alert those that are our uh, app appropriate authorities. C. Engineers are encouraged to extend public knowledge and appreciation of engineering and its achievements. So you're encouraged, to, again, to engage the public. Uh, D. Engineers are encouraged to adhere to the principles of sustainable development in order to protect the environment for future generations. And this is also part of you know, looking out for the long-term public interest, health, uh, welfare, and safety. In the short term, many times there are big bonuses for unsustainable development, but we're, as engineers, are looking in the long term for the overall health and uh, well-being of society. Point three, engineers shall avoid all conduct or practice that deceives the public. Point A, engineers shall avoid the use of statements containing a material misrepresentation of fact or omitting a material fact. So when you work with the public, be honest. And if, you know, for example, you're working on a uh, pharmaceutical product and this pharmaceutical product, you know, there's a material fact that, oh yeah, and it causes, you know, a rash or, oh yeah, you know, long-term exposure can cause problems. Well, that has to be disclosed. Whether it's disclosed, you know, through uh, your company's legal statements or it's disclosed, you know, in some other fashion, it has to be disclosed. And so honesty is not just about honesty of what you say, but it's also about honesty of what you don't say. You can't uh, omit the, the facts that are important. Uh, point B, consistent with the foregoing, engineers may advertise for recruitment of personnel. Point C, consistent with the foregoing, engineers may prepare articles for the lay or technical press, but such articles may not imply credit for the author of work performed by others. Okay, so here we're just saying that uh, maintaining this honesty about telling the truth and not omitting uh, important uh, content either, you can uh, be engaged in recruitment of personnel for your companies or your clients, and you may prepare documents or you know, video or press releases for the public, uh, but make certain that you're being honest. And, and also, we have to talk here about uh, not applying credit to the author for works performed by others. So you're not allowed to plagiarize. And plagiarizing is, is not just about the things you've done, but also the ideas. If someone had an idea for how to do something and then you implemented it, you need to give credit for where the underlying ideas came from. Point four, engineers shall not disclose without consent confidential information concerning the business affairs or technical processes of any present or former client or employer or public body on which they serve. So you're being told you need to keep confidence when you are on a panel and a panel makes a decision. You can't then go talk to the press about, you know, where this decision came from. Uh, let's go through A and B here. Uh, a, engineers shall not, without the consent of all interested parties, promote or exchange or arrange for new employment or practice in connection with a specific product for which the engineer has gained particular or specialized knowledge. B, engineers shall not, without the consent of all interested parties, participate in or represent an adversary interest in connection with a specific project or proceeding in which the engineer has gained particular specialized knowledge on behalf of a former client or employer. So not only are you supposed to be keep confident, but you're also supposed to avoid future conflicts of interest, whether it's you looking for work or, uh, you know, for example, working on uh, other boards or, or committees for the public. Uh, when an employer hires you to make a specific product, then you're forbidden from seeking uh, employment uh, based on that specialization, right? So say uh, uh, an employer or, or someone else wants to hire you to uh, deconstruct or to uh, make a competing product and, and you're forbidden from that. And fortunately, most of the time you also have a non-disclosure agreement you sign with your employer. Um, but even if you don't sign a non-disclosure agreement, uh, according to our code of ethics as engineers, you're not 
uh, allowed to use what you've learned to uh, profit. Point five, engineers shall not be influenced in their professional duties by conflicting interests. Point A, engineers shall not accept financial or other consideration, including free engineering design, from materials or equipment suppliers for specifying their products. Engineers shall not accept commission or allowances, directly or indirectly, from contractors or other parties dealing with clients or employers of the engineer in connection with work for which the engineer is responsible. Basically here you're saying you can't take bribes, and bribes can come in the form of uh, you know, professional favors, free engineering design. Bribes can come in the form of you know, reduced rates for equipment. It can come in the form of, uh, you know, contract work. So you can uh, receive extra contracts. You can receive favorable benefits in any, any fashion. Uh, you're not allowed to trade uh, your judgment and your you know, signature as an engineer for a preferential treatment. Uh, point six, engineers shall not attempt to obtain employment or advancement or professional engagement by untruthfully criticizing other engineers or by other improper or questionable methods. A, engineers shall not request, propose, or accept a commission on a contingent basis under circumstances in which their judgment may be compromised. B, engineers in salaried positions shall accept, shall accept part-time engineering work only to the extent consistent with the policies of the employer and in accordance with other ethical considerations. C, engineers shall not, without consent, use equipment, supplies, laboratory or office facilities, or an employer to carry on private practice. So, so basically here you're, you're saying that you may be employed, but you will not take you know, part-time employment on the side uh, that compromises your work as an engineer, that, for example, uses your employer's equipment, uses your employer's name, uh, or vi any other form violates uh, your agreement with your employer. And most of the time, employers have rules. So for example, uh, you know, professors, we are given a certain number of hours per year that we are allowed to do contract work, and we have to, to stay within those. And we're also uh, told about uh, the intellectual properties that come from our work. And these are all in our contracts. So it's something that if you're working for a firm, then as an engineer, you need to be aware of what these rules are and uh, to act accordingly. Point seven, engineers shall not attempt to injure maliciously or falsely, directly or indirectly, the professional reputation, prospects, practice, or employment of other engineers. Engineers who believe others are guilty of unethical or illegal practices shall present such information to the proper authority for action. Uh, point A. Engineers in private practice shall not review the work of another engineer for the same client except with the knowledge of such engineer or unless the connection of such engineer with the work has been terminated. Engineers in governmental, industrial, or educational employ are entitled to review and evaluate the work of other engineers when so required by their employment duties. Engineers in sales or industrial employ are entitled to make engineering comparisons representing products with products of other suppliers. So basically, you're not allowed to slander or libel other engineers or other engineering products. So for example, you're working for a company and you know, the guy down the way, you think that he's made some mistakes. Well, you can't go back and double check his work unless your employer requ requests you to do that or unless uh, he or she knows that you are uh, double checking their work, right? And this is about, you know, pretty much how you interact with other engineers so you're not uh, undercutting them in the workplace. You, know, you don't show up to a meeting and say, well, I know, you know, Bob or Mary presented this, but my results are different and my results are better. Uh, 
you know, even though they may be better, uh, it's still not an appropriate uh, behavior. Now, you are allowed to review other engineers' work if your employer requires you to do so, uh, or if the person is no longer working for the company. And in the same way, you're, you're allowed to compare products from, say, your company and your competitor's company, uh, but there has to be a, a truthful comparison. And this is both by what you say and by what you don't say. So you know, just because you don't say that your competitor's product, you know, has some attribute which is better than yours, that doesn't make it right. You have to point out uh, the advantages and disadvantages in as honest a fashion as you can. Point eight, engineers such shall accept personal responsibility for their professional activities provided, however, that engineers may seek indemnification for services arising out of their practice for other than gross negligence where the engineer's interest cannot otherwise be protected. Point A, engineers shall conform with state regulation, regulation laws in the practice of engineering. Point B, engineers shall not use association with non-engineers, a corporation or partnership as a cloak for unethical acts. So what this is about is it's basically saying that uh, your actions are your own and you have a responsibility for those. Uh, point B says that you can't hide behind a company and say, well, you know, I said that, you know, this pharmaceutical drug, you know, can sometimes cause heart disease and it's up to my employer and the lawyers in my company to, to make the statement. You know, if you have that data, you're not allowed to hide behind the lawyers from your company to cloak you from unethical actions. You're still behaving unethically. Uh, and you're also required to, you know, work with state re uh, regulations in terms of how you practice engineering, whether it's licensing or, or testing. Now here we talk about uh, indemnification for services, uh, and, and it's also telling you that your behavior uh, is shielded somewhat uh, from uh, litigation. So for example, as, as long as you're behaving in an ethical fashion, and as long as you don't have gross negligence, then any lawsuits uh, arising from uh, your services, uh, you are, are protected from, or you should be protected from. You know, so for example, say you uh, are working on the braking system in an automobile, you've you know, tested it according to engineering standards, uh, you know that they're safe, you certify them. You know, if something happens, and this is, might be, you know, for example, during the processing or maybe you know, material supply or something, and there is uh, a lawsuit due to uh, the brakes failing, uh, you should be protected as long as you've behaved ethically. And that ethical behavior also means that you can't, you know, mask failures uh, by passing it to the lawyers. You need to be upfront about that. Point nine, engineers shall give due credit for engineering work to those whom credit is due and will recognize the proprietary interests of others. So this is really, again, a statement against plagiarism. It says, point A, engineers shall, whenever possible, name the person or persons who may be individually responsible for designs, inventions, writing, or other accomplishments. You know, you don't necessarily know uh, the origin of certain designs if you're working within a company, but if you do, uh, even if the person is no longer working with a company, you need to, to recognize uh, what they've done. Point B, engineers using designs supplied by a client recognize that the designs remain the property of the client and may not be duplicated by the engineer for others without express permission. So this is about intellectual property and if you're using a company's uh, IP, it remains their IP. Point C, engineers before undertaking work for others in connection with which the engineer may make improvements, plans, designs, innovations, or other record that may justify copyright or patents should enter into a positive agreement regarding ownership. So this is basically saying that when you start working, you need to have the intellectual property 
uh, ownership uh, established and what you can and can't do. So, for example, again, professors, we work for uh, the state and in our contracts, we have uh, an agreement about intellectual property. So if we you know, design an invention uh, and patent this, there are rules about how we can use it, if we can license it, who we can license it to, and uh, how the profit goes with that. Point D, engineers design data records and notes referring exclusively to an employer's work or the employer's property. The employer should indemnify the engineer for use of the information for any purpose other than the original purpose. So what you do for a company stays with that employer. And that this last part about indemnification, this is saying that, for example, you know, your employer hires you to uh, you know, design skateboard wheels. And you, know, you do this, you, you leave the employer or you move to another project and the employer takes that design and they say, oh, now we're going to use this for, you know, uh, equipment for moving, you know, heavy machinery. And I say, well, that may or may not work, but you should be protected from uh, their use of the design that you left with them. And you're not ethically responsible for this. This is something that is, is outside of your control. Uh, e, engineers shall continue their professional development throughout their careers and should keep current in their specialty field by engaging in professional practice, participating in continuing education courses, reading in the technical literature, and attending professional meetings and seminars. So you have a, a responsibility for lifelong learning. Right, you're specialized in again you know, designing wheels or skateboards. Well, that's going to change over time, and in your job as an engineer, your duty as an engineer is to keep up uh, in the current design. So this, these nine points and and the uh, the canon, these are from the NSPE Code of Ethics. Now, what you do as an engineer, uh has consequences. There's consequences for what you do, both technically and, and ethically. And this is because what you do is important. The, the preemblem to the Code of Ethics you know, states, you know, what you do as an engineer is important. And that's why there's consequences for this. Now, as engineers, we don't focus on the consequences. And, and we focus on being good engineers. You know, the consequences, they're the result of an action or condition. Uh, so in my opinion, when we teach engineering students that, you know, we behave ethically because, you know, it's important for the, the safety of, of the public, well, that, that's not exactly true. We behave the way we do because it's what it is to be an engineer. And we have a, a long range perspective. This is what our code of ethics tells us about. Uh, we're not focused on the consequences. Now, these long-range consequences, they're, they're well known, right? If you behave as an engineer, uh, in a, in an honest fashion, technically and, uh, ethically fashion, um, in terms of how you uh, design and how you look at the future, how you look at environmental considerations, how you look at, uh, the overall health and, and, and welfare of the public, uh, long range, you're doing very good for the public. Uh, the short range consequences are well. And these short range consequences are, are much less predictable. So I want to talk about those here, uh, just as, as, as a matter of fairness. But, you know, you should know that the consequences of your actions, uh, from an ethical perspective, uh, are, are a little bit unpredictable. You know, so the consequences of, of you doing the right thing and behaving like a good engineer, is that, of course, you're going to safeguard the health and welfare of the public. Uh, and you're going to enhance and protect the honor, reputation, and usefulness of the engineering profession. I mean, we don't have, you know, there's, there's jokes about, you know, lawyers. And the lawyers are always kind of the, the butt of the joke. Uh, we don't have that about engineers. Engineers are, in general, respected by the public because good engineers, and there have been, you know, generations and generations of these good engineers, uh, they do right by the public. 
if you do the right thing, you're going to gain the respect of your fellow engineers. Uh, now, if you do right, other things may happen. For example, doing right may mean that you lose your job. Uh, you may be demoted by your employer. You may be fined by your employer. Uh, you also may be ostracized by your colleagues. What do I mean? I, I mean that if you do what's right as an engineer, uh, particularly if you are working for a company that's managed by non-engineers, your actions may be uh, viewed as, as damaging and people may think, oh my gosh, I don't want to work with this person. There's such a pain in the neck. Every time that I, I propose a solution, they say, no, we can't do that because there's some you know ASTM standard that violates. So I don't want to work with them. Well, tough. That's that's a consequence of doing the right thing. It's a consequence of looking out for the health and welfare of the public. Uh, but these are the short-term consequences. The long-term consequences of doing the right thing is definitely a win. It's a win for you, and it's a win for you know humanity on the whole. But uh, short-term, you may have difficulties. Now, there's consequences for doing the wrong thing. If you do the wrong thing, you might lose your job. You might be Demoted, you might be fined. You also might get a raise. You might get a promotion. Uh, your fellow engineers may ostracize you for doing the wrong things. They, well, yeah, I, I saw him and he or she, they, you know, made shortcuts and they didn't follow the standards. And your fellow engineers may not want to work with you. They may report you to the, uh, NSPE. Uh, but you also may gain the respect of others. You know, oh, you know, he or she came up with a, with a really great idea for, you know, circumventing this market problem we had. You know, these are non-engineers, but these non-engineers may help you. Uh, you may receive professional penalties. You may be suspended. Your license may be suspended. Uh, your credentials may be revoked. There have been cases where engineers have lost their degrees from their institutions of higher education. People have had their PhDs revoked because they've been caught of, in fraud. Uh, if things go very badly, you may face criminal or civil suits. If you behave unethically and you produce a product that is dangerous, that endangers people's lives, this could lead you to, you know, wrongful death suits. Uh, things go, you know, very badly. You know, you could be, you know, liable for, for a wrongful death. You could be even wind up in prison for, for manslaughter for your behavior. So, in, in general here, you know, being a good engineer and doing the right thing the short-term consequences are, you know, up and down. Long-term consequences, uh, the, the, uh, the short-term consequences are doing the wrong thing also, you know, positive and negative. But we know that in, in the long term, being a good engineer means behaving ethically. And this is where we're going to have the, the greatest uh, gain for uh, society. So thinking about how engineers fail ethically. Most engineers, where they fail, they don't plan a, a large-scale uh, ethical breach. No one does that. Almost no one, right? I'm sure there's some you know, sociopath that, that might, but most of us know we don't. It starts out with something small, right? You, you may exaggerate your successes or de-emphasize your failures, right? And, and in doing so, yeah, you, you'll get a promotion of your, your project and your team. Right. It might be that you have a project that's working except for one little part and you hide that part. So this is a ethical failure by, by not being honest, by not telling all of the material failures. And you do that because you know that if that failure comes up, they're going to defund the project. You know, people are going to lose their jobs. The company may lose contracts and you're going to hide this because you know that with enough time, you'll get a fix. You'll know how to solve it. And that's. That's a form of ethical failure. Uh, another form is, is plagiarism. 
using other people's ideas without getting credit. You know, you say, oh, I borrowed the idea. I say, well, no, you didn't. You stole the idea. Uh, but that's a form of ethical failure, and it happens. Uh, misrepresenting competitors' capabilities. Again, this is about competition. And as time has gone, the competition is, has gotten steeper and steeper, right? We're not just competing nationally, we're competing internationally. And the bottom line of, of products is, is a big deal. So there is a, a real temptation to misrepresent your competitors in order to gain an advantage. Another example is discarding outlier data that doesn't support your product's claims or project's claims. Uh, and there, you know, there's reasons that there really can be real outliers, but you have to have evidence that those are real outliers. You can't just say, well, you know, this looks good except for these three data points. Let's get rid of those. So these are all small failures, but these small failures or these small ethical breaches, they will give you short-term gains. But these lies, they, they always catch you. And the reason that these type of lies you get caught in is because no one lies about something inconsequential, right? You make a lie about, you know, this product works great, except that, you know, it causes your hair to fall out or whatever, right? That lie, it's got to highlight itself because it's something critical. Uh, so you need to be careful with that because you are going to get caught. And I you know, have some examples here. Like there, there was one example of... Uh, Iowa State University, there was a professor in, I can't remember which department, but uh, he falsified data from uh, HIV vaccine experiments on rabbits. And he did this because if he didn't falsify that, he would have lost funding. And that loss of funding represented, you know, graduate students, postdocs, uh, it represented, you know, pretty much his livelihood at the university. Now, Falsifying that data meant that literally millions of dollars went into vaccine trials that were doomed to be failures from the beginning. And those are millions of dollars that could have gone into other ideas. But this fraud, you know, protected himself. And, you know, I don't know if, if this person was going for tenure at the time, but it, it was, it was a significant failure. Uh, another example was, it was covering up the airbag failures in automobiles. This was the uh, uh, Takata Corporation, and they had airbags that, uh, when they went off, they would you know, spew a hot metal on the passengers. And it was covered up for years, both by the, the company that was making these and the cars that were putting them in there. Uh, you know, there, were, there was loss of life in this, and the engineers involved in it, you know, they may say, well, you know, I reported this to my supervisor, but... That's not enough. They failed because they let public health and, and, and safety lapse, uh, hiding behind the management structure and the lawyers and their company. And the third example was the, the space shuttle Challenger explosion, right? And, and this was uh, NASA and the uh, USA Corporation, which is the uh, United Space Alliance. They, are, they were responsible for uh, preparing launch vehicles. Um, and basically, they had a part that they knew underwent a, uh, a ductile to brittle transition below a certain temperature, and the, the O-rings in in these seals. And you know, the question came up: you know, do we launch the space shuttle? And this was a, a high-profile launch because uh, we were putting a, a civilian up in a space. And they said, "Oh, sure, go for it." I mean, somewhere, I'm sure there were engineers that said, "No, these these parts aren't." aren't rated. And in fact, those engineers, they were identified later that they had taken their concerns to management, but it stopped at that point. The, the people above them, uh, overwrote their, their concerns. And we, we go back to the, uh, NSPE, uh, rules of ethics. One, if your concerns about the health and safety of the public are overridden, then you're responsible for alerting the proper authorities and the engineers did not do so. What happens if you violate ethics? Well, you, you lose reputation and that, that's, that's a big thing. Uh, 
but we have we have a, a set of processes by which uh, ethic violations are are investigated, and it's important that you you follow these procedures. Uh, a lot of these have to do with you know being a licensed professional engineer, but it is also within other professional societies that look at what you've done. And it's important that we follow these procedures because we don't want to come to a situation where you know rumors are what govern penalty. Uh, we want to have a, a fair uh, investigation of people's behavior from peers within their community. So announcing, for example, to the uh, NSPE that you believe there's been an ethical violation of, of, a, of a colleague or uh, an employer, you know, they can open an investigation. And if you're a licensed uh, PE, uh, you will be listed as being under investigation if you are being investigated. Uh, and upon the conclusion, you may be cleared, uh, you may be suspended. Uh, your employer, depending on, on the rules of your state, may have to suspend you. Uh, you may receive a, a censure from your company or from the professional societies. You may lose your job, and you also may be subject to uh, civil or criminal proceedings for, for what uh, you've done. Uh, but this is something that the good news here is that we do have this, these engineering professional societies that, that will look at what's happened in a, a fair and judicious fashion. So that's uh, good news if there is anything in, in uh, ethical failures. And a lot of times the failures themselves are, are, are considered within the, in the context of, you know, was the public welfare uh, compromised? What were the costs? Uh, how did the ethical violation come about? So, in summary of, of, of this discussion of engineering ethics, uh, these ethics are, are statements of shared values. They're, they're not externally imposed. These are the values that good engineers have in common. Uh, we have these code of ethics that essentially help to clarify your commitments. And it helps you understand the balance between your duty to yourself, your employer, the community of engineers, and, and the public. As engineers, you have uh, responsibilities and your actions have consequences because your actions are important. Um, consequences for you as an engineer are really not what you're thinking about. You're focusing on ethical behavior, but these consequences follow uh, after the fact. Um, now, right or wrong, uh, your actions will bring both rewards and, and punishment. Uh, you know, admittedly, you're behaving appropriately, there's typically not a lot of rewards for you uh, individually. You know, you drive to work in the morning and you don't get an award for not you know, running red lights, right? You do get penalties if you do run red lights. Uh, you don't get uh, awards for behaving safely, but you do get uh, penalties for behaving unsafely. Uh, but even then, you have short-term and, and long-term uh, consequences. And the short-term consequences, as I pointed out, can be variable. Uh, long-term consequences are that you know, society uh, on the whole and the engineering professional will benefit. And, and lastly, uh, perceived breach of ethics will necessarily trigger uh, investigations. And uh, I say it, it sounds you know, daunting, but these investigations are conducted fairly by engineers that will themselves uh, well, they themselves are, are subject to the same engineering ethics and honesty and transparency. So this is something that I think is, is good news. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen to this lecture.